I mentioned in the first um, paper, the first paper was on general issues about Islam and Muslims. Uh, the <laughs> main emphasis and the main issue for evangelism I want to make clear was that Muslims are, can be very, very different uh, in what they believe, how they live, and we should basically meet everyone as an individual, as a person, and try to understand what is concern to him, what are his questions, what is his worldview, um, what are the things that concern him, and try to enter into a real meeting of person and uh, talk to him and see him as uh, someone who was created by God and whom you meet and have a privilege of meeting him and sharing of being a Christian. So that is basically what I intended from the first uh, paper. And <clears throat> we'll now talk about how to meet people, how to, to connect, how to, to talk to people, um, and how to share the gospel. Um, we will, not, of course, talk about an issue that is being viewed differently by Christians and Muslims, and we have to understand that. We share the gospel, and our prayer is that a Muslim would eventually grasp who Jesus Christ is and commit his life or her life uh, to, to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So we talk about conversion and a convert. And that looks, of course, quite different from a Muslim perspective. He talks about someone who is an apostate, who leaves Islam, who is treacherous, who, uh, whom they don't want any longer uh, a relationship with. So it's a very, very big issue for, for Muslims if someone leaves Islam. And uh, that makes talking to Muslims and particularly the issue of conversion at times a very touchy issue. And it's good to, to understand that. And for that reason, I will talk first of, uh, about the issue of conversion, uh, to understand what it means for both uh, sides, to understand what is happening and how should we accompany someone who is in the process of conversion. Most or almost all conversions of Muslims don't happen on the spot in the first talk. But for almost all Muslims, it is a lengthy process. And if you look at it, it's a process of leaving Islam slowly and coming nearer to the Christian faith, being attracted and eventually making a decision. And we look into that process um, in order to, um, um, to um, understand what we, what we mean. I have a friend, uh, Dr. Reinhold Strähler. He was for 10 years 
um, oh, do you have some paper? How, how, how come? I'd actually, oh, uh, I'm not sure, Jeff, whether that helps or whether that actually distracts from, I didn't, did I send you by, by mistake the, the whole paper? Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Uh, that was actually not intended. Then I probably uh, got it wrong. Instead of sending you the the outline, I, I sent you the paper. Yeah, that's fine. So, like, do you want to just go without the... Um... Uh, without the paper. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. That doesn't... I don't think it, it helps, really. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I talk back about Reinhold Streller. He was a missionary for 10 years in Egypt, but then he did a doctorate in Kenya about Muslims in Kenya coming to faith in Christ. And he wrote his doctorate about it. And I, I got a copy of that. And I found it very interesting to, to see that. Um, and I want to just share some of the basic insights he found in this uh, um, conversion process of Muslims in Kenya coming to Christ, to, to faith in Christ. He realized that uh, the changes that take place is on two levels. One affects um, of course, the mental process, the issue of insights, understanding, knowledge, but also there is a process and a change of attitudes, of emotions with regard to Islam, with regard to Christianity, to Christian faith. Uh, so there is a... Um, um, a big change in a person when it comes to conversion. Generally, if we talk about conversion, we have to understand no one of uh, no Muslim and neither of you would want to change religion. And he would only do that if he's convinced at the end that changing the religion, the new religion, would be better, better suited to his personal life situation, to his aspiration, to his goals, to his understanding of the world. So only if that happens, someone will really uh, change religion. Otherwise, why should he? Um, and that means, of course, that if we talk about uh, conversion, it's a whole process and it's good to understand. And the first issue that he, uh, my friend, uh, studied was what are the motives? Why would a Muslim change religion? Why would he chain, leave Islam and why would he embrace the Christian faith? And of course, there are major studies on these issues. There's a study by a Catholic white father in Tanzania. Um, and he uh, investigated the issue, why do Muslims change? Why do they convert? And if you understand the motivations, it helps us in our thinking how to connect where to start, what to ask, or where, what to talk about it. Um, the white father, Dr. Uh, Jean-Marie Godel, he found that a big number of Muslims who become Christians, they do so because they find Jesus Christ so attractive. And I've, I've read stories of um, Muslims in, in Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries, who's the same? Uh, 
who start comparing Jesus with Muhammad. And the more they learn about Jesus, the more attractive to, uh, they come. The personality, the way Jesus uh, deals with women, the way he talks to people, his loving concern, being considerate, his respect for people, his love for people, uh, his help for people, all that is very, very attractive to a legalistic religion like, like um, Islam. Um, we need to understand, for example, that Jesus, of course, um, is written about in the Quran. They don't speak about Jesus, they speak about Isa. And there are 93 verses in the Quran that speak about Isa, about Jesus. His birth, what he did at youngster, that he did miracles, that he healed people, and often that he was sinless, and that at the end of times he comes back. So Muslims, if they know a bit about the religion, they know quite a lot about Jesus. And so there is a good point of starting talking with Muslims about Jesus, because they know about a lot of it. Then the second motive why Muslims turn and become Christians, in Islam, the, you, you don't really connect with, with, with Allah. Allah is distant. Yes, you, you, you have to obey him in your ritual prayer. You touch with your, with your forehead the, the, the floor several times a day. You have to obey a lot of things. So it's very legalistic, it's ritualistic. And many people are not satisfied with that alone. They, they thirst with a personal relationship. And so seeking God in a personal way, that is a big desire in, 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 in many pious Muslims. And again, there is an, uh, an area where we can connect, where we can share our faith and how we live with God and how we connect uh, in prayer and in his word with God and what we, uh, our experiences is. I uh, was in a meeting with, with some uh, Muslims here in, in my hometown uh, some time ago and we talked about Corona and how we deal with it. And I shared uh, how I, I met people who were dying and how that Christian was expecting to die and preparing himself. And I shared how we pray together, how we laugh together, how we cry together and how he died. And it was very moving for, for, um, for these Muslims and um, they shared their experience. So there are levels where we can talk and the issue of Jesus, the issue of personal thirst and search for God, for truth is very, very important. Another area why people uh, connect is um, when they, they long for a loving fellowship. And not every Muslim has got that. Many don't have a family or have a harsh family, have a harsh father maybe. Um, and when they meet a loving church and a loving fellowship, that's very, very attractive. And they come and they live with us for a time and they are open, they want to know, why do you live that way? And so again, that is an opening for sharing the gospel. Another area is the issue of forgiveness. Many um, 
Muslims have inner struggle with sin. They know that they all know, every Muslim knows, in the end he, have to, he has to give account before God, the throne of God. And many are very, very afraid of hell. And so sin plays a big role. And many want to know. And if they meet a message of forgiveness, many are very open. I remember when I was in Indonesia, <clears throat> once a Muslim cleric, a young man who had just finished his MA in Islamic theology, and he came and he shared. And so I explained the gospel to him, explained uh, how Jesus died. And eventually I asked him whether I could pray with him in the name of Jesus. And so we both knelt down and prayed. Um, so that can be a good start in order to share the gospel and teach people uh, because they long for forgiveness and assurance of salvation. That doesn't exist in Islam. You never know whether you will enter paradise or hell. There is no assurance. You have to go, and I will explain it at the end, uh, through a lengthy process of probing, of giving account, of doing things before you enter paradise. So looking for assurance of salvation. Another um, issue is truth. I've met um, Muslims who have read the Bible and the Quran side by side, comparing. They want to know what is the truth. They, they are aware there are different religions. They are aware there are different books. The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the Christian Bible, the Quran, and they are just intrigued and they are not satisfied with the claim of Muslims that the Christians falsified the, the scriptures. So they want to, to study themselves, they compare, and there have been actually Muslims in Egypt, I know a story of that, someone who was actually a terrorist and who got a command from his leader to study the New Testament to find issues how they could attack and argue with Christians. And so he studied the New Testament and the more he studied, he became a Christian. So finding the truth, knowing what is real and what is the truth uh, leads people to change. And then there's a group of people, not so small. I've met many stories in the Arab world and we had it among my students in uh, Indonesia who had dreams and visions of Christ, who, who met Jesus in, in a dream and Jesus would tell them something. And uh, there have been tremendous stories about that. So or others have experienced healings, miracles uh, through prayer. So the, the experience of the extraordinary, the, the miracle, miraculous uh, also plays a role. There's another study by an American professor who uh, investigated 600 former Muslims from 39 different countries. And um, again, he was very interested in knowing the, um, the motives. Why do Muslims uh, convert? And they were similar to the, to the motives uh, that uh, Jean-Marie Godel uh, described. The search for assurance, uh, assurance, uh, assurance of salvation, the person of Jesus Christ, the study of the Bible. Just to give you an, a, a story about it. When I was in Indonesia, 
in Sumatra, at one time, um, a Muslim came to me and he said, three years ago, someone in a train gave him a New Testament. And he took the New Testament and took it home to his village. And in that village, there was no church, no Christians. And he was a, a coffee, he had a coffee plantation and people in the, in the, in the uh, village grew coffee. So they drank a lot of coffee in the evenings and couldn't sleep. So he, together with 16 friends, read for three years the New Testament. Only Muslims. They discussed it among themselves. And now he came and said, we all want to be baptized. We want to become Christians. I didn't know what happened afterwards, but years later, in 2013, I visited that area of Sumatra again, and I was driving with the leader of that denomination uh, in the villages of that area. And one evening at 10 o'clock in the evening, I told him that story. And he said, oh, Dieter, that could have been this village there. And he took his phone and called the pastor and asked whether in 1984, a group of Muslims had been baptized. And the pastor said, yes, 14 Muslims had been baptized. And that was that group that had studied together just the New Testament without any help of any Christian, just giving that New Testament to one person and 14 Javanese Muslims became Christians. So you see even the, the search for truth can make such a big difference. Um, the other issue is uh, love, experiencing love. I have a friend, or he died actually. He was a Muslim, a Javanese Muslim in Indonesia. And he had studied Islamic theology and had almost finished his, his MA in, in, uh, in Islamic theology. And he hated the Christians. So in his home village, from time to time, he would take a stone and throw it into the windows of the church. And one day, he had done it again, the pastor came over to the, to the house of his parents. And Vagiono, that's his name, said, oh, no, no, I know what will happen. But the pastor came and the pastor said, oh, hi, Vagiono. Yes, we know what you do, but we love you. And went home again. And that made Vagiono think about it. And he started to find interest, studied the Bible, and eventually converted, became a Christian, studied theology, did a doctorate at Fuller in, in uh, theology and missions, and a lecturer in uh, our, our seminary in, in Indonesia. So often that encounter with loving concern of Christian can play, play a big role that we really are concerned with the people. We, we help, we, we are considerate, we pray for him, 
we might help in different ways um, and people might say oh i want to know more about your faith i know of a of a, a american missionary in bangladesh and he stayed for three years in a Muslim village. There was no church, no Christians. And he tried to share the, his faith. And after three years, nothing happened. And he was so frustrated that he decided, oh, I, I, I leave that village and go to a different place. And just before he left, his neighbor came. And the neighbor said, Mr. So-and-so, I've watched you for three years. How you talk to your wife, how you talk to your gardener, how you talk to other people, how you educated your children. And it's very appealing. It's very attractive to me. I think you are a good man. And I would love to, to hear more about your faith. So our example as Christians, as people who are concerned for others, who love others, uh, it plays a role. As a witness for Christ, we need to be real people. Um, and our faith needs to be authentic. And uh, there are issues that become attractive. And I have had another uh, colleague in Indonesia, a lady, uh, oh. formerly who had been a, um, a head mis um, leader of, a, of a, a secondary school. She had a doctorate. And she taught English at a university, a Muslim university. And because she was a Christian, Christian and because the Muslims trusted her, she was a, the treasurer for the whole of the university. And when she wanted to leave, they said, no, no, you can't leave. You are the only person we trust. We know you. And we know you are a Christian and you have to stay. And again, you realize our lives as a, is a testimony in the way we live out our faith. And that's important that we, we take that on board and uh, yeah, and share our faith in that direction. Uh, there's another study about motives, why people convert. There's a study by a Swiss doctor who did his doctorate in South Africa. And again, <clears throat> uh, he found there are different motives. At times, it has to do with truth, the search for Jesus, for, for God, the, the testimony of Christians. Um, there are many important reasons. We had a similar study in Indonesia. There was in one time in the 1960s, a big move of, of Muslims to Christianity. Um, and it, it had to do with political issues. The Muslims had attempted a coup, a political coup in the country and they had killed a number of generals and so on. And eventually that coup was put down and the new government wanted that every person believed in God. And because so many people hated Islam, they changed over and became Christians. About 6 million people, Muslims, became Christians at that, that time in the mid 19. 1960s. In one particular church in the north of Sumatra, that church, that denomination, Presbyterian Church, had 35,000 members. Within three years, that number tripled 
and became over a hundred thousand. And you can realize how difficult it was, was all Muslims who, who entered, but they were not properly disciples, just Christianized. And you can see the problem there. So that is Muslim, that is the motives. And I think understanding the motives of a person, why someone is interested, helps to, to connect, to find the right issue to talk about. The second um, insight that my friend had when he investigated about the process of conversion, he realized that it is a, it's not a sudden decision. It is a process. Um, and he could define five different phases or, or times. There is a time before a Muslim has any interest in Christianity, then something might happen. And um, he shows interest. In, he wants to know. Maybe someone prayed for him. Maybe he had a dream. Maybe he met someone. Maybe someone shared something with him. So there is a beginning when some, when a Muslim starts to have interest and is searching. He becomes more aware of the Christian faith. Then comes, based on a decision by the Muslim, he wants to know more. He wants to really know. Though there is a phase of an intensive interaction um, he wants to understand new thoughts, new insights. And eventually it comes to a time when he realizes, I have to make a decision. Either I go on and embrace the Christian faith and become a Christian, or I stop and return to Islam. And then the last phase is that he has made a decision for Christ, but one of uh, an old missionary whom I met in, in, Lib in, um, in Lebanon and who had worked for 30, 40 years in Lebanon, he said, it's easier to lead a Muslim to conversion than to really keep him there and disciple him and lead him on to mature Christian faith. So it's a very important task to someone who has made a decision to help him to really grow spiritually, to become mature, to be able to understand the word of God and in prayer and reading the word of God, feed himself spiritually. So yeah, that are you. the different phases for uh, conversion and then the issue of integration into the church and becoming a, 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 a mature Christian. The third insight so that my friend had with regard to the conversion process he realized that in that process relating to the different times, there are changes, changes with regard to understanding and changes with regard to attitudes. And um, if we know that, that it is a slow process, we, will probably be more patient because often um, in accompanying a Muslim in his conversion process, we realize that he might suddenly say something or do something which uh, shocks us or which uh, um, 
and we find difficult to understand. Um, I know of one of, in our, our uh, college or seminary where I taught, um, it was a five year program to study theology and do a bachelor and eventually a, a master's degree in theology. And I remember one of my fifth year student, former Muslim, even at that level, he still at times shared and said, from time to time, it still grips me that I wonder, is it really true with the divinity of Christ? So um, that is a big issue for, for Muslims who formerly really were deeply integrated into the Muslim faith. If you of course have a Muslim who is very superficially Muslim, who doesn't struggle with that. Um, you had the same, if you know church history, you know that the Lutheran church, there was Martin Luther, and he, he was a professor of theology deeply rooted in Catholic theology. And at the end of his life, he said, from time to time, I still then Catholic aspects come up and I have questions and str struggle and have to go back to the word of God and research it again for me. So we realize the deeper someone is in something, be it theology, be it Islam, be it the different religion, be it the occult, it will affect him and can affect him a long time. And Luther says, Calvin had a different issue. He was a lawyer. He was not deeply steeped in, in Catholic theology. And therefore he, he was quite a different way of, of expressing his faith. So even on the Christian level, we realize what Muslims go through, and if they really were true and, and pious Muslims, they will struggle with questions, different questions than we might have if we come from a different background. And so there are different issues as they move forward in the uh, conversion process. So the conclusion is, um, that the conversion is a complex process, different dimension in the cognitive in, uh, side, the, the emotions, the way of living, how to express this, the understanding needs to change, the belief system changes, our worldview in a way is, is uh, um, entering into the picture. So we need to sympathize with people who, who, who are in that process. The second conclusion is, yes, we need to be patient. We need to be authentic and loving and uh, need to know that God is loving that person and God wants him to reach the truth and to know the truth and to find peace in Jesus Christ. Okay, coming to the next point, how to reach out, how to start. Um, I think the first point is to just relax and love people. To me, that is um, the best starting point. To have concern for people, to love people, to love my Muslim neighbor, and to meet him as a people, as a loving people. And on that basis, often it will start. Um, there's openness. 
and sharing, there's openness to say, oh, may I pray for you in this situation? I mean, our neighbor might have a problem on his job. He might have a problem with his children. He might have other problems. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very easy to care for people. And one of the long-term missionaries in North Africa, Charles Marsh, he once said, in nearly every case of conversion of a Muslim, he has first been influenced by Christian love, that he has met someone, a Christian, where he said, oh, that person has something that I would love to have too. He might see the peace in us. He might see the love in us. He might see some, the honesty. And uh, so that is often the starting point that, uh, that uh, a Muslim meets someone where he says, there is a truth and I want to know it. The second point which I would make is, do not insult or attack Muhammad or the Quran or the belief of uh, another person. No one of us would like it either if a uh, con convinced Muslim attacks the Christian faith or attacks Jesus and blasphemes Jesus. Um, so the respect for a Muslim, for his faith is, is um, important. It's also important <clears throat> to understand if I talk to a group of Muslims, every Muslim in that group, if they are together, and I talk to a group of Muslims at the same time, every Muslim feels I must defend Islam in front of this Christian. There is social pressure on, on the Muslims and therefore no one in front of other Muslims would want to uh, admit that he's interested or he will really wants to know or that he is open to Christianity. So it's always the best way talking one on one so that the Muslim doesn't have to fear what the other Muslim beside him knows. Because every Muslim knows if he eventually would become a Christian and get baptized, he will have faced difficulties in the Muslim community, in his own family. So there is a cautiousness in talking with a Christian. And for that reason, it's always best to talk one on one. The third point, <clears throat> Don't be flippant, casual, or disrespectful with um, the holy things. For example, in the West, I don't know what, how you do it in, in Kenya. We would, if I, if I read the Bible, I often underline something. I use different colors. My Bibles look colored. No Muslim would do that for, with the Quran. He would not write in the Quran. He would never put a Quran on the, on the floor. He would never go uh, be disrespectful to the Quran. He would always try to put the Quran above his own head and put, if he doesn't read it, he would read it on a little table. He would put afterwards the Quran wrapped in a cloth uh, on, a, on a cupboard to be high, to put uh, the Quran at a high place. So that's the way how, how um, 
Muslims deal with Qurans, and we have to understand that. Um, you will find Ameri particularly American missionaries who are more casual in these issues, they would pray with their hands in their pockets. That's unimaginable for, for a Muslim. A Muslim prays very, very, he knows he stands before Almighty God. So he would either raise, stand and raise the hands or would kneel or even prostrate in prayer before God, but never just sitting with his knees crossed and uh, maybe his hand in his pocket. Doesn't do that. So holy things for pious Muslims are holy. And we have to understand that. So it's also an honor and shame issue. And um, we need to understand that and behave properly in this issue. The fourth point, uh, try to, uh, when you ask a question, don't ask a question which could be answered yes and no. And ask a question which is open-ended, meaning ask a question where the other person um, has to share a bit and tell a bit about himself, about his faith or so on. Um, and always be a good listener, show interest, let him share. Most Muslims are quite, quite uh, um, open in sharing and they love to share about their faith if they are pious Muslims. And uh, so it's good to, to, um, to, to listen well and we will, you will, will find Muslims who don't care what, what other people think about their faith. I mean, I have been in, in Mauritania, um, in Western, Western Africa, and um, we were drinking tea together, one Mauritanian Christian and Mauritanian Muslim, and it turned three o'clock and he get, got up and in front of me, he would have his afternoon prayer. I wouldn't mind at all. I've seen Muslims in the plane. I've seen Muslims in the airport. I've Muslims, I have been in buses in Indonesia and the bus would stop at certain times at prayer times and the Muslims would get out. And in the field, they would take their, 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 um, prayer mat and they would pray. I mean, they don't mind what other people think about it. They, they would, they're quite, quite open about that. And the same way they share and we need to be good listeners. And uh, we can also share openly about our faith. Most Muslims, particularly here in the West, they are astonished that there are Western Christians who pray. They think all oh, Christians never pray. Um, so they are quite keen of meeting genuine Christians, uh, loving Christians, Christians who pray, who, who share about their faith, who, who, who are concerned about faith. So that makes it actually quite easy to talk openly with, with uh, Christians. Um, at times, Muslims will ask you questions. And they might come up with questions which are difficult to answer or uh, which are provocative or which would lead in, or could lead into a fight. They might ask you, what do you think about Muhammad? Was Muhammad a real prophet? Do you consider him a prophet? Or what do you think about the Quran? Is the Quran the word of God for you as a Christian? Uh, or they would talk about Jesus. <clears throat> 
So it is good to think about these issues for yourself. At times, it is better to evade a question. I know of one missionary in Lebanon who said, when I'm, I'm asked about Muhammad, I always tell my Muslim friends, you see, I'm not a Muslim. I don't really know. And therefore I cannot answer your question. I can talk about Jesus. You can ask me everything about Jesus, but I can't answer your question concern uh, and a question about Muhammad. So he would, he would avoid that. Uh, and he said, my Muslim friends in Lebanon have always accepted that. <clears throat> so it's good to know in talking with Muslims, it is not our purpose to win, to win a, 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 a discussion. It is to give loving answers, to help Muslims to understand and to help them to ask questions themselves. I have a Moroccan friend, a medical doctor who came to faith, who eventually also went to Bible college and eventually became a, a missionary with, with our mission and served as a missionary in Yemen and later in Morocco. And his ability, because he, know, he knew his faith, he knew Islam. So his gift was to ask open-ended questions to Muslims in a very loving way to make them think about their own religion and to, to realize, oh, there are problems. And, oh, I have to find the truth. And in setting them on a path of searching for truth, finding eventually the word of God, the scriptures, the Bible, and understanding. So helping Muslims to question their own beliefs and their own way of, of Islam is helpful of setting someone on a path for the search for truth. And that is, uh, that is important. Next point in uh, dealing with Muslims, <clears throat> we should never act, because we are Christian, act in an attitude of superiority, that we know it all. But we, we should be humble in, in talking with Muslims and, and loving and full of concern. Yes, we, at least in the beginning, I would always avoid politics and, and certain, certain issues. I also, uh, I would not eat in front of Muslims at Ramadan, uh, because I know that my Muslim friends would, would fast, then I, I would not want to, to eat in front of them in order to be respectful. So um, it is this attitude of us, humility, being respectful, not being flippant, being uh, not coming with an uh, attitude of superiority, but being humble, um, that is going well with in talks with Muslim, Muslims. In some talks with Muslims, we will come to a point where the Muslim will attack Christianity. That's quite common. That they make horrendous statements about Jesus and we feel we need to defend our faith. I've come to the point where I say, no, I don't need to defend God. God can easily fight for himself. 
God will defend himself. And yes, I would, uh, I might correct something which is wrong, but I would be very careful not to get into a fight over, over certain issues. And now coming to the, the more positive side, as I mentioned before, if Muslims really understand who Jesus, who Isa is, that is very, very attractive. And as I mentioned, there are 93 verses in the Quran that talk about Isa, of who he is, what he did, how he lived, and, and so on, and what position he has got in Islam. So in our talks, we should focus on Jesus. Now, Jesus is mentioned in Islam. Of course, he's only the, the servant of God. He's a messenger of God. He's definitely not divine. He's not the son of God. The Quran says he is Isa al-Masih. That means he is the Messiah. But the Quran doesn't define what Messiah means. It's a, it's a title. And they don't really know it. That Messiah, if you translate it into uh, Greek or into English, Messiah means the Christ. They still wouldn't know. So the best way of sharing is uh, it was in Indonesia it's in all the countries where you have an oral culture where you talk where you share stories and where people love hearing stories um, what I found good is to read one gospel, let's say Matthew or Luke or John, again and again and again, and to know it so well that you basically could tell all the stories of the gospel of Matthew to another person and do it in a vivid way with illustrations adjusted to the situation and the culture of your tribe, of your, your country. And Muslims love to hear stories. And by telling a story, you convey biblical theological truth. And you can always, in talk, when you talk to a Muslim and you talk about Jesus, uh, say, oh, would you love to hear a story? And for example, tell the story that the shepherd would leave the 99 and search for the one that got lost or tell the story of the lost son or the lost coin or any other story. So storytelling is a good way. But for that reason, you need, of course, to know the, the biblical story well so that you can share it well and share it in a lively way. So that, uh, and of course, that's what Jesus did, that, he was in front of people and he would share stories. And the people loved it, hearing him telling stories. I don't know whether you know about the, the new films, The Chosen, uh, that is being produced in America and now being viewed worldwide uh, on the internet. And it shows so clearly how Jesus is dealing with people, how he's telling stories, how he's loving people. And that's exactly the way how we should, uh, should deal with, with uh, Muslims. Um, but the next point would be, particularly at the beginning of a talk with, with people, I would keep to helpful topics. Um, you probably know that most of the Old Testament people are also mentioned in the Quran. Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Hagar, 
Musa, Moses, Noah, Nuh, um, Jacob, Joseph. Um, so Job, so you easily can take Old Testament stories and share them. And again, with the stories, share biblical truth in order to help the other person to think about it. These stories work in the, in the, in the heart of people. And it, the stories will lead to other questions and, and the people might come back and ask you different questions and gives you an opportunity to share further. So that is a good way of sharing stories and helping people to think about their own faith. Again, you have to realize it's a process of leaving Islam, being more and more interested in the Christian faith, wanting to know, interacting, getting to understand truth, and eventually coming to a decision point. So we have to think in these strategic process-oriented terms and to find out what would be helpful in that process for a particular person in that process of knowing Jesus Christ. Next point, <clears throat> in understanding Muslims, it would be helpful to have read the Quran. I've read the Quran many times and um, of course you immediately realize the difference, the difference between the Quran and the Bible. And uh, one question that is being discussed by missionaries who work among Muslims is, should we use the Quran or not? I think on the one side, yes, having read the Quran, know what the Quran is saying about certain things, how the argumentation of a Muslim would go, what he, what the Quran says about Jesus, about Ibrahim or Abraham and other uh, of the biblical heroes uh, is helpful. But to use the Quran, to quote the Quran, to compare what the Quran says with the Bible, I personally would not do that. And I will give you in a moment the reasons why I would not do that. Uh, a different issue, I think I mentioned it uh, already, I have often offered Muslims, can I pray for you? And I've never met a Muslim who has said no. I remember that I have been called to Muslims, into Muslim homes, to, to pray for someone who was demon-possessed. And they couldn't deal with that. And they asked a Christian to do that. So that is, um, that is always an option to, particularly if I meet someone who, who is encountering a problem and then I can offer to pray. Um, and it's well received. Um, I've also often shared with Muslims when we came about, uh, talk about uh, our faith, shared how I live my faith, what I do, how I pray, how I study the Bible, what it means to me, how I deal with, with grief, how I deal with joy, how I deal with ethical issues. Uh, that again is an area where we can 
share our faith in a way that is helpful, that is not controversial, and that is attractive to, to, to Muslims. If it is possible, give your friend a New Testament or a Bible. But when you give it, give it with the right hand. In Western culture, we often don't mind to give things with the left hand. But I, of course, learned in a Muslim country like Indonesia uh, that the left hand is dirty and that you never uh, do anything with the left hand. You always have to do it with the right hand. So give the Bible always with the, uh, with the right hand. Then there's another area where, which is touchy and where we can get into a conflict with <coughs> Muslims. Uh, when we come with the understanding, oh, you Muslim worship the wrong God. When we say that to the Muslim, he would of course not accept that. And even in talking to Muslims, I, I don't use that word. I don't, I would never say you are, um, you are um, uh, serving the wrong God. Because if you think about the Muslim faith, what they do is they believe in an all powerful, omniscient, um, God who is present everywhere, who has created the world, who sustains the world, who will call the world into account. Everyone has appeared to him, who is dealing with people. Uh, Muslims pray to him, they fast, they try to obey him. So there is a belief in God. So I've talked to Muslim converts about that. And they would say, no, I don't believe that I, I believe in, a, in another God. I haven't known God. I had a certain image of God from tradition and from the Quran, but I haven't known him personally. Now as a, Christ, now as a Christian, now I know him. I have a personal relationship. I experience him. I love him. In Islam, you can't love God. You don't, have, you don't call God Father. A Muslim would never call God his Father, our Father. God is distant. And therefore, he hasn't got assurance. He hasn't got a personal relationship. And therefore, um, the Muslim converts and I had met many uh, who would say, no, now as a believer, I know God. I love him. He's my heavenly father. And I follow him. I know his word. And that is helpful in, in talking to Muslim because as I mentioned, Allah is not the name of a God. It simply means God. It's a generic word. And it's good to understand the differences, what the Bible says about God and what, Chris, uh, what, what Islam says about God, what the Quran says about God. Yes, both say, there's only one God. But you know, from, from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 6, from the Hear Israel, Shema Israel, God, and actually there says Yahweh is your God. There's only one God. And then it goes on that we should 
love God with all our heart, with all our emotions, with all our strength. And Jesus has repeated that in, in, in Matthew 22. So on that level, there are similarities, but Muslims don't love God. They fear him, they obey him, they follow him, they prostrate, yes, but they don't know the love of God. And um, when we talk about the Trinity, um, that is very touchy. I've always approached by sharing about Jesus. Because the Bible, the New Testament, doesn't, the word Trinity doesn't occur in the Bible. But share stories about Jesus, which makes it clear and clearer and clearer who Jesus is and that he is divine, that he has the power that he died and there was resurrection, that he is at the right hand of God and that he comes back and that he did miracles, that he forgave sin. So by storytelling, you, you, you share basically that issue of divinity um, so that it becomes clearer and clearer if you enter in that topic in the terms of theology, in terms of apologetics, you will more easily encounter difficulties and get into fights. But over with storytelling and telling who Jesus is, you convey it. And that is much easier for the, for the Muslim to accept that there are three, three persons. Um, the Muslim often will come with surahs that very clearly say that Jesus only was a messenger, he was a human, and no, he was not divine, and there is no trinity, and they will quote uh, this, the Quran with it. So um, we help him by sharing stories and showing who Jesus is. Just need to look the time. It is, yeah, still have enough time. <clears throat> Let me share about uh, using the Quran. I know that some missionary do that, that they would, they know the Quran so well, they might even know it in Arabic and they might quote. I don't do that. Yes, I've read it. I know it. I know what kind of questions, what kind of beliefs uh, Muslims have. And I can address my biblical input with that knowledge in the background. But um, I, I don't use it because it is at times easy that as I am a Christian, I attach a Christian meaning to a Quranic word verse that is differently understood by a Muslim, at least by a Muslim scholar. And uh, I wouldn't want to get into a discussion over these issues. Also, if you quote the Quran in order to support a Christian tr biblical truth, you elevate the Quran to a level that becomes almost holy scripture. And I would want, wouldn't want to do that. Um, only God's word, the Bible is God's word. And I would not give the Quran that eminence of being word of God. Uh, I only 
try to, to understand how someone who is trained in the Quran thinks and what would help him from a Christian perspective to understand biblical truth. So, um, I, I evade that question if they would uh, ask me whether, whether the Quran is, is inspired by God, I would not, I said, I'm not a Muslim, I cannot really say that, and I would not answer that question. I would only say, no, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, I love the word of God, the Bible, and I can tell you about that, but I will not talk about the other issues. Now, the, the next point, what do Muslims um, believe about the end times? And we'll find that the end times, the final judgment, play an immense role in the, Christian, in the uh, Islamic belief. It's often mentioned in the Quran. It's often mentioned in the Islamic tradition. And the last day, so to speak, there are 21 different synonyms, similar words in the Quran and in the traditions to speak about the last time. And uh, they believe that the, the day of judgment will last for 50,000 days. And it's a day of resurrection, the day of catastrophe, the day of separation, the day of judgment. And um, with slight differences between Sunnis and Shia and other types of, of Muslims, the following is basically the, the line of thought. Um, they believe that at the end, they have to give account before God of everything they did. And their understanding is that there is an angel on your right shoulder and he writes down everything which is good in your life and there's another angel on your left shoulder, and he writes down everything that is bad, bad words, bad thoughts, bad deeds. And that at the end, these will be weighed, the good things and the bad things. So that is um, what happens in your life. And because it will be weighed, and because you don't know how God will look at it, and whether Muhammad will intercede for you or not intercede for you, you don't know whether you will be saved or not saved, even in a good life. And, and therefore, there is no, no assurance of salvation. And then when you die at death, there are uh, two angels again, Munka and Nakia, and they will sit on your grave, one at the head, one at the feet, and they will ask you four questions, the Muslim, they will ask the Muslim four questions. Who is your God? Allah. Who is your messenger? Muhammad. What is your religion? Islam, and uh, what is your direction of prayer towards Mecca? So when you have um, given accurate answers, that's the belief of Muslims, you get to go to the next stage. If you have given inaccurate answers, these two angels, Munka and Nakir, will torment you in the grave. It starts already. If you give the wrong answers, you get tormented in the grave. Then eventually the <clears throat> signs of the last day will appear. And if you read the Quran and listen to the 
Sunnah, the tradition, some of the issues sound quite similar to what revelations tell us about earthquakes, about heaven and cosmic things that happen. And uh, then at the end times, a kind of an antichrist, like in Revelation, appears, the al -Dajjal. And as in Revelation, he is a great deceiver. He tries to deceive the Muslims. And Muslims are afraid. And then at the end times, Jesus, Isa, Isa al-Masih comes back and he kills the Antichrist, the al -Dajjal. And if you have studied Revelation, you realize, wow, there are similarities. That Jesus comes back and kills the Islamic Antichrist, the al -Dajjal. But Jesus does more. And then it becomes, of course, quite, quite weird for us Christians that Jesus will kill all the pigs because pork and pigs are forbidden. Jesus will uh, destroy all the crosses on earth and he will convert to Islam. And at the day of resurrection, he will pray with Muhammad in the mosque. And he will pray behind Muhammad. Muhammad is more than Jesus. And Jesus will get married and he will have children and eventually he will die. So that's a story about uh, Isa, Isa al-Masi. Um, and in the event, in the end, uh, in the, end uh, the heavens will melt away and all the people will resurrect and uh, come to life again. And again, similar to Revelation, there will be um, trumpets. And at the sound of the first trumpet, everyone will die. And then there's a second trumpet. In Islamic tradition, there's even a third trumpet. But at the second trumpet, all people will resurrect, come to life again, and then they will have um, to have account um, and uh, have to 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 um, stand before God, before the throne of God. And the Quran and the uh, tradition speak about it. And then at that point, the good deeds and the bad deeds will be weighed, what is heavier. And if your bad deeds are heavier, okay, then you're lost. If your good deeds are heavier than the bad deeds, they're more than the bad deeds, okay, you go to the next phase. You have to cross a chasm a valley of fire, and you have to do it on a razor sharp bridge. And depending of who you are, and depending how good you lived, you can either cross that bridge at a lightning speed, or at the speed of a galloping horse, or if you have many sins, you have to crawl with your sins on your back over that bridge. And if you can't do that, you fall into the fire. So again, it's not certain ever whether you will make it or not. And uh, uh, only a few will do it and surely only good, pious uh, Muslims can reach paradise 
and uh, uh, live in paradise. And if you read the Quran, the paradise speaks about all the, the joys of paradise, all the, the, your wife will be there and uh, many virgins will be there and wine will be there. Everything that is forbidden in Muslim life today, they will enjoy in heaven. So it's a very materialistic uh, view of heaven. And most think, particularly the Shia, no, they won't even meet God in paradise. So that is not really the aim. And uh, so this is the basic um, issue of uh, the last time. In the Shia belief about the end times, there is still a Mahdi that the last Imam will come back and basically he has similar tasks as to the uh, to Isa al Masih who comes back at the end of the time. So there they exchange the Mahdi with uh, Christ. A few pitfalls at the end, or oh, let me look how much time I have. Jeff, can you tell me when I have to stop? Yeah, it's actually now we need to stop here, but I uh, we have like a couple of questions. Yeah, like, okay. Okay. All right, so um, let me just check what's in the chat box. Mm. So um, the one of the questions, um, so can you say Islam elevates the Quran in the same position as Jesus of Christians? Both are words or books, right? Is it, that's the question. Yeah. Um, yes and no. On the one hand, the Quran is divine. They deal with it very respectful. But the real Quran is in Arabic. And the astonishing thing is that many Muslims hardly know the Quran. What is astonishing in the Arabic world, and uh, that has been testified uh, again and again, that Muslims being in the, to understand that you have to understand the Arabic language has the everyday language, and it has the standard, the, the um, high Arabic, and the Quran is in the high Arabic, which is not the usual the day to day language. And it is in a kind of a rhythm, prosa, rhyme. And what Muslims have testified to and converts from Muslim to, to Christian faith as well, that they almost get into a trance when they listen to the reading of the Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, Quran. So it is rather the sound, the listening more than the content and that with regard to content, the knowledge of Muslims are often quite limited. Uh, you will find Muslims who have never read the Quran. Of course, you have the same among nominal Christians who have never read the Bible or who might never have read the, the Old Testament. Uh, so, Yes, the 
uh, Quran plays a very, very strict um, role. It is very important for the um, Islamic law and for your practical life, for the rituals and so on. But it, it has, doesn't have the same, same role that in my relationship with a living God, living Jesus, that in reading, that I take it as a love letter from God to me, and that it speaks to me in a sense that it doesn't speak to a Muslim. And uh, particularly Muslim converts have testified to that, that for them, the Bible has taken on quite a different role and has a different place in their lives. Okay, so another question. So, um, so kind, kindly ask the speaker to address the issue of Mihadra. I'm not sure it, it is right pronunciation or not. The public, yeah. yeah, public preaching and open attacks the, of the Bible and Christianity versus ah. humble and respectful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think most of those who have testified to Muslims have at times experienced. Um, that a talk can go into a fight or into a debate and uh, which becomes hot. And therefore, <clears throat> um, we try to avoid that in a polite and humble way and at times, what I do is, if, let's say, a Muslim asks me something and I realize in order to answer that properly, I would have to explain many things prior to answering the question. I would tell them, I think there is a more important question prior before I can answer it. So I, I go on explaining what I want to explain. Um, uh, or I, I give a limited answer, or I, if it is, let's say, if someone would ask me whether I believe the Quran is a word of God, or whether that is inspired of God, I know, of course, he believes, the Muslim believes, it's divine. But for me, it's not divine. And if I say, no, it's not divine, then, of course, it will offend him and he will hotly debate it. So I simply say, look, I cannot answer it. I don't really know. I'm not a Muslim. And uh, therefore, I, how, how, can I, how can I know that? Only a Muslim can really know it. And uh, so in that way, I try to avoid touchy issues which uh, get me in hot waters. Um, at times, I, I would answer a question only partly, um, not fully. Um, I think, yes, I, what I say must be true, but I don't have to say everything I know. So I, 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 I answer in a polite way, in a humble way, uh, trying to avoid uh, conflict or avoid uh, just a, a shouting match, which doesn't help uh, both sides um, as much as possible. And of course, we know the Trinity, the divinity of Christ. Uh, yes, I mean, um, there are ways of getting to it almost to the point, in a polite way, as I mentioned, with stories. It was interesting when 
you might have known that Mel Gibson had made a, a, a film about the, the cross, the crucifixion and so on, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago. At that time, <coughs> because it was a famous film, it was debated in the Muslim world whether that film could be shown in the Muslim world. And in quite a number of countries, it was shown. And they came up with the, um, with the uh, explanation and said, yes, we believe that Jesus Christ was on the cross, but he didn't die on the cross. And if you know um, church history, you know that in the third and fourth century, there was a similar sectarian view of, of Jesus, that Jesus didn't die at the cross. Yes, he hung there, but God exchanged him with someone else. So that person who died at the cross only had the appearance of Jesus Christ. And obviously some uh, Islamic theologian who have studied uh, Christian history know about it. Though they have come up with, this, with the same story and say, yes, Jesus was on the cross, but he didn't die. He was taken up. And because there are two surah verses in, um, in the Quran where it says that Jesus was taken up, they say, aha, he didn't die. He was taken up to God. And that's the reason why at the end times he comes back. Uh, so if you know that type of reasoning, it helps you to fit in a, a little more of the truth of divinity and you come nearer to the point. Um, because that uh, taking up looks a, bit, a little bit like ascension that God was, that God took Jesus to heaven and he's now at the right hand of God. And um, also in the Quran, Jesus, for example, there's a story of a, a boy, Jesus, and he formed birds from clay. And then he told the birds to fly and they flew away. And the word that is being used in the Arabic is a word for creation that is only used for God. So even in the Quran, you have, have words or have stories that actually point to divinity. Also that Jesus is sinless, whereas Muhammad is being, being uh, talked about having sins and God has forgiven his sins. And, and therefore, there are ways in, in discussing issues with Muslims where you can touch on certain issues that help the Muslim, Muslim to move forward a little bit more and eventually grasp the understanding of divinity without, because you have to understand for Muslims, the Trinity with his, which is uh, rejected in the Quran, the Trinity understanding is that God shared the bed with Marie, Miss Mary, and they had a child, Jesus. And of course, that is blasphemous for us too. And therefore, it's blasphemous for the Muslims. And there was probably a secta Christian sectarian view on the Arabian Peninsula at the time of Muhammad, which believed that the Trinity was God Father and Mary and Jesus. 
And of course, that's rejected by Christians and rejected by Muslims. So you have to, you can also correct a, a wrong understanding. And when we talk about Trinity, we don't talk about three gods. It is one God. And uh, it's very interesting. I, I read some time ago the life story of a, of a, a Muslim who, who became a Christian, actually a Christian missionary eventually. And how he was a medical student and his friend was a medical student and they studied together and there was a deep friendship. And they talked a lot about uh, the Christian faith, but the divinity of Christ was in, the Trinity was was impossible for the for the Muslim. And he shared that at one time in a in a lecture, medical lecture, of chemistry, organic chemistry, the professor explained a certain molecule. And that in the molecule, things changed around and that there were three different parts, but every part was all three at the same time. And, and suddenly he thought, oh, it is one God. Yes, it's three. But wherever we, we meet, it's one God. So something which is difficult to grasp mentally or rationally, this Muslim saw in, in chemistry that uh, something, something similar can happen. And he said, oh, if that can happen in the natural world, why can't I believe that God is, is one and is three at the same time? So um, there have been, even in the West, different kind of ways trying to convince people of a trinity, but all these figures or models or examples um, are theological and not fully correct. You might know that, that water can be, can, be, can be vapor, can be ice, but that is basically modalism, that God is changing from one state into another. That's not what, what the Bible says. It's always three, and in everyone there is the whole God, fully God. And uh, rationally, we, we cannot rather cannot agree. We can only share the story, what Jesus does what the Holy Spirit is doing, and in that sense realize, oh yes, there are three, and in all three, God acts and is there, and in that sense, the Trinity comes together. 